It is no secret that the Japanese people are both a group and a culture that are unlike really anything in this world. Covering a wide range of expertise, the people of Japan have contributed more than many even realize to fields such as art, craftsmanship, fashion, warfare, science, and medicine. And one thing that absolutely cannot be denied is that out of all of the collectivist societies in the Far East, once the Japanese people set their sights on a goal, they commit themselves to it with a zeal and passion that really not many are capable of matching. I mean, for Christ's sake, this is the place that is genuinely building a real-life mech. I mean, okay, probably not functioning as we would think of it, but they're genuinely building a mech. What the hell? But the thing is, it wasn't always this way for Japan. Once, it was a country and people who were strange and exotic to those across the sea in their vicinity. And to the Western world, Japan had closed its borders for hundreds of years with the intention of preserving its purity and uniqueness of its culture. But after the Meiji Restoration, Japan realized that it was solely behind in basically every kind of way that a country could be, from technology, to its medicine, to its military, to its political thought, everything. And at first, it tried to catch up with this through um, more militaristic means, among all things. And so from the turn of the 20th century to just after World War II, Japan would commit itself to becoming an empire with a singular focus and the tenacity to do whatever it could until its national will was eventually broken due to sustained bombing campaigns and the dropping of nuclear bombs upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now look, I know what you're going to say at this point, Stack, like why, why are you talking about this? This whole thing is supposed to be about Japan and Japanese war culture. Why are you talking about Hiroshima and everything getting bombed. Well, to be fair, you have to understand what something was before you can understand what it is now and how it became that way. From committing themselves to 50 years of just destruction and conquest of everything around them to themselves eventually getting destroyed, Japan going into the late 1940s and into the 1950s was having a little bit of an uh, identity crisis, so to speak. I mean, the economy that it had at this point is comparable to the crisis that is ongoing in Venezuela. Hyperinflation, a complete breakdown of services, there was really no way that anyone could do anything, and yet Japan came back. What happened next is known by many as the Japanese economic miracle. From roughly 1947 all the way to the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s, Japan would set itself to become a massive leader in global business and is currently the world's third largest economy. Now you're going to look at this and go, how did they go from ruin to a complete 180 to become the third dominant power? What was, before the rise of China, the second largest economy in the world? Well, that is with a significant amount of pride being swallowed and a lot lot, lot of hard work. Japan would turn the United States from its most dangerous foe to its largest foreign business market in less than a decade. And at the same time, it began to prepare itself in the 1950s and 1960s for production and manufacturing to the world. And so when the world came with opportunity, well, boy, was Japan prepared for it. In 1973 and 1979, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, more commonly known as OPEC, would set embargoes on oil. And as a result of that, the countries of the Western world would see gas prices rise dramatically due to the circumstances that were essentially out of their control. The first oil crisis was caused in response to countries that had supported Israel in the Yom Kippur War. The second was as a result of the Iranian Revolution. Either way, for the average person, the short of it was that gas prices went from $3 a barrel in 1972 to nearly $40 a barrel in 1979, which is quite literally a 1,000 plus percent increase, which is a lot. But the thing is, during all of this, the Japanese had been building their auto manufacturing infrastructure for years, and they were making vehicles cheaper and more fuel efficient than anything that you were going to be seeing in Western manufacturers. And all of a sudden, during this time when they were focusing on efficiency more than anything else, the price of fuel doesn't double, it doesn't triple. As I said, it increases by over 10 times over. Which, to the people who are looking at purchasing vehicles and what it is that they're going to be doing with them, yeah, a, a Japanese car is going to be significantly better during this time than any kind of American gas guzzler. In less than a year from the second oil shock of 1979, Japan would surpass Detroit its entire production totals, becoming the first in the world. And the share of U.S. auto purchases at the time that were Japanese jumped in the U.S. market from 9% in 1976 to 21% in 1980. At the same time that this happened, it really pushed all of the European car brands out of America so that you either had American or you had Japanese. And that was pretty much it before the Koreans came in. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation right now, but you didn't really find many things in the form of Renaults, Opels, Pugols, Pugots, Puget. I hate French so much. And others. The short of it was that they could not simply keep up with demand and they couldn't modernize their car fast enough to actually be more efficient. Japan had finally built the empire that it always wanted, except this wasn't exactly in the form that they thought they would have. It was economic more than anything else. And so as the 1970s ended, Japan's entire business and economic sector became so important to its people that its infamous work culture and the, quote, salaryman trope began to develop. 
The thing is, with such a strong work ethic and commitment to both their country and also their culture, the Japanese people chose to prioritize work over pretty much any other kind of part of everyday life. They would work long hours not only because it was a necessity to get the job done, but also as a means by which they could show loyalty to the company, which, for many of them, became not a thing that was actually just encouraged, it was required. Like, that was just the standard that was done. Going above and beyond and doing even more was the new normal. Here's how bad this was. Overtime was not a thing that was codified into Japanese law until 1987. Even to this day, the Japanese government is still finding out about certain black companies, which is a term that means that it is a company that will overwork its employees for essentially no overtime. This is so common that quite a number of people over the course of recent Japanese history have worked themselves to death. It is in fact so common that unfortunately there is a word for it in Japan. Karoshi. The word karoshi roughly translates to overwork death, or quite literally, working oneself to death. The first case of karoshi that has been documented occurred in 1969, when there was a 29-year-old male worker in the shipping department of one of Japan's largest newspapers who suffered a massive stroke due to stress from overwork and unfortunately passed away. In 1988, a survey that was done by the Japanese Labor Standards Bureau found that almost one-fourth of its entire male working employees worked over 60 hours per week, which, mind you, again, is 50% longer than the standard 40-hour work week than you will see in most places. But that all being said, there are cases of people working way, way, way more than that. In some cases, going into the 1980s, 100-hour work weeks were not something that were unheard of, which is insane. Now, you would think that when an economic crisis would occur, that this would cause an economic slowdown that would lead to people having to work less. No. The thing that occurred once the Japanese economic bubble finally burst is that as employees were let go, there was even more work for the people that were still left behind. And so work hours actually went up during during this time because there was more work for people to do in order to try and keep the same level of productivity, just with fewer employees. The unfortunate reality is that without employees going on strike or suing a company or doing anything, a lot of this just simply isn't going to come to light. And that cultural mindset of working environments can many times seem like the longer you work, the better that it's going to be for you. Because it's showing that you're a very valuable employee. If you're complaining, then you're going to be seen as being someone who is difficult to work with. And if things go bad in the company because you work the least amount of hours or complain at all or broach any kind of issue, then you're going to be the first person to get let go. Oftentimes what this could lead to is that an employee would work the normal amount of hours that are actually needed in a day, and then they would actually just hang back at the office for a few hours extra afterwards. So it looks like that they're doing more important things and being productive for the company. It's all about those optics. Now, that being said, I would like to clarify that over the years, especially within the past 10 years or so, things have gotten better within Japan. The worst time during all of this was definitely going into the 1990s, and there is a reason why there are so many different anime and other stories like that that are isekai, meaning getting transported to another world. They usually begin with the death of a character, either from getting hit by a truck or by overworking themselves to death in an office. While it was particularly bad in the 90s and it still is a problem, it has been addressed to a degree. So now again, you're probably going to look at me and say, Stack, why are you focusing so much on the negative aspects of the work culture? Well, again, th th there's reasons. It's about context. The 1980s and 90s saw Japan explode onto the world stage with not only its reach in business, but also with its culture and perhaps most significantly, its media. Anime began to reach Western viewers and is now recognized as an art form in its own right that is watched by tens, if not hundreds of millions of people every single day. I suppose that in the end, that is where you would see a lot of developments into Japanese media as a direct response to this concept of karoshi, of literally working yourself to death. I'm sure that many of you are probably already aware when looking at a lot of things for Japanese media, but it's rather unique, both in the forms of game shows, general television, video games, anything along those lines. A lot of it's many Western audience can probably seem even bizarre, especially in comparison to what you would usually expect of the more reserved Japanese people. But if you think about things in terms of what we've already been talking about with the history of karoshi and and what it is that Japan did to modernize and develop, it really makes sense that a lot of wacky, crazy things are used as a form of stress relief to the Japanese populace. Whether you are looking at karaoke, whether you are looking at Japanese drinking parties after work, 
or gratuitous amounts of wackiness and or violence that you could possibly see on television and on other programming, well, it's um, it's all designed there to be able to distract you from the horribleness of everyday life when you are stuck working for a job in order to fuel an industry. I will say this here in the end. Everything that I've tried to explain in this video is out of love and admiration for what Japan has been able to do over the past several decades. Yes, there are absolutely negative effects that you've seen upon the populace, and really Japan is going to be having to deal with that in the next several decades itself. Rising inflation and aging population, lower birth rate, we're probably going to be seeing Japan's population plummet by more than half over the course of the next generation. And so the benefits, as well as the negative effects, are all things that have occurred as a result of Japan's direct hard work. Emphasis in this case on hard work. I hope that this video was able to kind of explain how all of this came to be, and I really cannot wait to go and actually visit Japan here in the next several months, because uh, in November, I'm going to be leading a group of 24 people, and we're going to be going to Kyoto. I can't wait to actually be there and see all the different things that helped to build it to what it is today. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope to see you all next time. Please let me know in the comment section below what it is that we should do next. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you everyone for watching, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.